Magnus uh, from, from Amsterdam. And today what we want to do is sort of showcase the whole, the whole platform and show you how we get from an idea all the way in, in 40 minutes to an application uh, that works. You know, limited functionality, but it's going to work. It's going to do something. And this is where it ties in very nicely with, uh, with what Alvaro just said is, you know, uh, low code, no code is really a way, whether it is for internal clients that you might have where you where you work or for external clients uh, as a developer a way of very quickly developing exactly something made to measure um, and being able to iterate and reiterate on a, on a continuous basis to to keep improving what you've made and offer a way of getting people involved in the development process which you will see while that uh, um, is doing the demo, even though you guys have never seen uh, one before, you will be able to follow what we are doing. You know, there, there will be things that, that are a little bit, okay, what's going on here? But most of it, you know, the process, the way DAO is gonna map it out, uh, will be clear for everyone. And, and that's really the, the, the great power of, uh, of WEM is that you can have very short lines between the developer and the business uh, and making sure that, you know, you get a one time right uh, final product made there. I will not take up any more time and hand it over to, to Dawa. Thanks very much, Dawa, for, uh, for being here. Okay, thanks, David. Uh, let me share. Uh, yes, allow. <clears throat> Don't use Google Meet a lot, so I hope this works. Uh, what are you seeing now? Yeah, we're seeing uh, your Google Meet screen. Oh, that, that's not what I want. Actually, I what think we're I... seeing your full... Yeah, we're seeing all oh, of your I... screen. What now I... we're seeing your emails. And now? Uh, seeing your email still. Still my email. I think we're seeing a, a full display share. Uh, no, no, but I have multiple screens and it's yeah, uh, showing the wrong screen. How about now? We're Yes, now we're seeing the modeler. Nice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> As David already mentioned, now you're seeing the modeler. So anytime you build something in them, you do that by using the modeler. And uh, David has made a start last night um, with a data model. And the only reason we did that is uh, because building the data model is easy. And uh, um, I can just show you now uh, what we didn't do is we didn't add a list of students and uh, creating the entire data model. It's uh, when you do it once, you see how it works. So we thought we do this already. Um, so I'm only going to add a list called student. So let's say first name, uh, last name, and um, email. Oh, that is not what I saw. Email. And as you can see now, I've only added text fields, but there's multiple type of fields that you can add. And you can see here and on the icon that the other database uh, list. So we have courses, we have programs, we have trimester. Uh, they're already added with different types of fields. But in our case right now, all I need is uh, first name, last name and email. And um, this allows me to immediately start with building the flowcharts, which are actually create the logic of the application. And as you can see, <clears throat> we started from scratch. So we only have one flowchart, which is the home flowchart, and that's created automatically. And um, here on the left, you see all the nodes. And nodes are just blocks of functionality, uh, in essence. And by dragging the nodes to the canvas, you can create an application uh, any way you like, really. So right now, that's that's just what we're going to do. And at first, I'd like to start with creating a, a screen for all the um, the the uh, um, database list that we have. So I'm going to start with uh, courses. So start with a new flowchart, course uh, overview. 
like this and first drag an interaction node to it call it course overview and when i double click it i can start building the the template itself and this is the screen that a user is going to see so i'll keep it simple and call it here uh, drag in a panel call it course overview and here i'd like to see all the courses that i have in our system start with code and name and program trimester and credits and you can see based on the order that's also the order it uh, it uses the only thing you see here, these are reference fields. And if you know anything about uh, data modeling, this is what we call a, a foreign key. So in this case, we have a, for, a reference to program, meaning one program can contain multiple courses. That's how this works. Uh, the only thing, since this is a reference, we have to tell the system what I'd like to see here. And that's just the name of the program. And we also have one for uh, trimester, and I'll just call that, uh, I'll just use the name of the trimester itself. And now I've created a very, very simple screen. And VEM allows me to now see what I've just built by clicking preview. And as you can see here, this is the preview and these are the fields I've just added. And the nice thing about this preview is that um, when I change something, so for instance, uh, I can change the, the color by using the style context and change the heading. And maybe instead of trimester ref, I just want to see trimester. And here I'd like to see program and save it. Now, then will update almost instantly. So it's really useful to see what you're doing. And um, the only problem right now is that I don't have any data in it. So <clears throat> I'd like to add some way of adding data to the system. And first I'm gonna show you how to create a simple uh, a screen to add and edit. And afterwards uh, we can do uh, what David did is he made some data and we can import that. But first I'd just like to do it by hand. And um, for that I'll use a table and this table only is useful to help me with uh, uh, alignment and that kind of stuff. So all I do now is add a button, it's called uh, new uh, course. And that's aligned to the right with an icon with a plus. And instead of new course, I'll call it uh, course. Now, again, if I save it first a different color, so it's at least visible you'll see the course button here appearing, which doesn't do anything. Uh, that's why it gives an error, because what I've done is I've created an exit in the interaction node, which is called new course. That's the one I just added. And now what we need to do is add the logic behind that button. So in our case, it's an add row of courses and a screen with the course details. So I'll just call it details and I'll show it as an overlay. You see the icon changing meaning this is a, an overlay or a pop-up, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this is, again, double-clicking it allows me to create it, and I'd like to be able to edit all these fields in it. And you can see here row in programs, because again, this is a, uh, a reference field. So again, I have to tell them, you have to look at the label, select program, and uh, I can also say it needs to be sorted by the name, like this. Same thing for trimester. I'd like to sort it by name. Or no, in this case, I'd like to sort it by start date. And I'd like the label to say the name. And the label is here, select trimester. Now, I can also say the code and the name, for instance, are required and the credits. And now all I have to do is say save. And the save button, I can give an icon or another plus like a uh, floppy. And a color like this. And I can do cancel. And this one has an undo icon. Save. So now this screen is ready. And now I can add the save node. 
and the discard all changes node. And now all I have to do is add the, uh, or drag the arrows in the right order. So cancel goes there and save goes there. And now I've created a very, very small system that allows me to add courses. So one, two, three, ABC. And I don't have any programs yet. And this is 100. Uh, one very nice thing about this is that I can also already um, publish this, uh, which, but then what I need to do is point this uh, course overview to, or from the home chart, or flow chart to the course overview. And now I can already do the, my first publish if I want to. Of course, it's a little bit early, but it's just to show you that this already works. And while it's publishing, I can uh, wait. Oh, it's already done. And now I can go to uh, this uh, URL and you can do the same. It's a little bit complicated, David, but uh, <laughs> so this is, uh, it's in Apologies. the chat. And anybody, anybody can go there. Please don't add any courses right now. Well, well, you can, I'll just delete them when we do the import, that's fine. But you can try for yourself. Um, now, we have the option to add. But of course, when I uh, add a, I'm going to close this in preview. When I add a course and I've made a mistake, program is not there yet. Now I'd like to be able to edit it. And then I can do that quite easily by going to the data grid and decide for an on row click exit and say edit course. I'm just going to call it edit. And if I save this, now again, I have a new exit called edit. And again, I've added some functionality, which allows me to edit this program. And cancel. Now, this is already adding it. I can edit it. Well, last step is to delete. Well, with delete, I'd first like to do, are you sure? And show as overlay. This one has an exit called uh, cancel and an exit called delete. And now, if I go here, I'd like to do a, oh, first I need the button. I'm going to add the button to the, uh, the row. And the button is called, follow button exit, called delete. Again, I can style it a little bit. Instead of the text, I'd only want to see an icon right now. So trash bin. And I'll make it uh, red, just so it's obvious. Save. And now we have delete. Uh, and when I click cancel, I don't want to do anything. But when I click delete, I'd like to delete the course. Delete row. And then delete. And now I've also added the delete button. So if I click it now, oh wait, at first I have forgot to create a screen here. I'm just going to keep it simple. So only are you sure? Add a delete button here. Add a cancel button. <coughs> Undo. Uh, delete is uh, red with a trash. And I'm going to change the overlay size to small because I don't need much. And now if I click delete, it's an are you sure? If I click cancel, it doesn't delete. If I delete, it's gone. Um, it should be gone. Well, while I'm waiting, because I'm short of time, I'm just going to do the same thing for programs, trimester, and student. And just to make my life a little bit easier, I'm just going to copy the flowchart. This is a program overview. This is, uh, again, copy it. This is a trimester overview and we have um, another one called student overview Stu student overview like this <clears throat> well it's deleted here as you can see it was a little uh, demo glitch of course um, so we have course overview we have program overview of course i need to change some things so call it uh, program call this i'm just going to call it new 
instead of add row for courses, I need an add row for programs. So new and details is not filled with the uh, course details, but with the program details. And I can say create form from all fields. The only thing these two I don't want. So <clears throat> that's fine. And this is ready now. Then we have the main screen, which is now, of course, courses. Instead of that, I'd like programs. Call it uh, name or first code and name. And here I'm moving the button to there. And this one again has an on row click called edit. And here again, instead of courses deleting, I'd like to delete the program. Like this. Yeah. Okay, then the program is done. Sorry? Sorry, just in the in the flow charts for the overview, you left uh, yeah. the button and the title to say course. Good one. Program and program. Oh. Okay, next one is students. This one is student add row, student delete row. Here again, I'd like the students. Yeah, that's good. I'm not going to bother right now with required fields, but uh, here again, it's student overview. Like this. Uh, create data grids. And I'm just going to use first name and email. And I only selected first name because instead of this, I just like to see first name with a space plus last name. And what I'm showing you now is the expression editor. And this expression editor is used for uh, filters, calculations, all that kind of stuff. And if you've ever used formulas in Excel, you'll notice quite a bit of similarity. Uh, because a lot of those formulas are also available in them, uh, plus some more. But um, and you can see it's quite easy to use. And in this case, I've just used instead of just showing the first name, it's the entire name first plus uh, last name. And here again, I'd like to use the button delete. Align it to the right, and the exit is again edit. So now the last one was trimester. So now open the trimester. And uh, we have here trimester, yes. So trimester. Again, this one is an add row. This one is a delete row. <clears throat> uh, of course. No, change this one. From all writable fields, I'd like to start with the name. So we can just change it easily, as you can see. And here we have an overview of the trimester. And then we're almost done with creating the basic screens to edit the, the supporting data, so to speak. And I've just used the same way to uh, save time because uh, we can m gives us more time to do all, all kinds of other stuff, trimester. Safe. Now, 
if I click preview now, you'll notice that only the only thing I see here is courses or course overview because I haven't uh, added these uh, flowcharts to the navigation yet. And the navigation is here, the, uh, the um, uh, navigation bar, as we call it. And with home, I'm just going to, for now, add a screen that says uh, welcome. And I'm going to add the flowcharts that I just created to the navigation. So here in the navigation, you can create menu items. So we have courses and courses points to um, course overview. And you can change the visible when. So now I'll just use true, but you can do all kinds of elaborate expressions uh, based on the roles and, and the roles you defined. So you can do role-based access in a very elaborate way if you want to. Uh, we also have um, programs. And that's also true. And we have uh, students of first trimester. Points to trimester overview. And the last one is students. Students. Like this. And uh, oh, this is true. And now I've created a, a very simple application which allows me to edit my courses, to edit my programs, to edit the uh, trimester, and they all uh, work. Uh, and if I publish this now, it will also be visible in the uh, staging uh, um, uh, environment, which is a separate database. Uh, and you can see here, and also if you've access this on your uh, computer, then you can see uh, it working. Now, uh, next step is importing. And we're going to import the uh, data that um, David has provided. And we're going to do that in the courses. To import data, I'm going to use a different flowchart just to be, because it's way easier to uh, manage by, in that way. So uh, import courses. And here, I'll add a button and I can just add it from here. So import, separate it a little bit, make it blue so it's obvious and uh, give it an import icon. And this one, instead of an exit, it points to directly to this flowchart. And the first step that I need to do is create a uh, way to select the import file, select file. Again, in an overlay. And I know already I have a button called cancel and I have a button called imports. And if I double click it, all I want to do here is be able to select an import file. For that, normally I use a system um, folder and I create a new field called uh, file. doesn't really matter how you... And this file is... And just drag it there as a form. Uh, input file. And I already created that those buttons. So this is the import button. This is the cancel button. I'm not going to bother with any uh, um, format or layout for these buttons right now. Um, but I already know if it's cancel, I don't want to do anything. So here, cancel, I'm just going to end it. And if you if it finds the end node, it's going to go back to where you started. So in this case, I've started from the courses, so that's where it's going to end. Um, if I've created the, uh, if I've selected the file, then the next step is to import the file, which is done by the import node. And as you can see, you can import different uh, formats, but in this case, it's uh, I think a CSV. And the source is the file, and the destination uh, is a. I'm not going to do it directly to the database, but one thing what them allows me to do is I can create a mapping from an example. And I just remembered that I forgot to download it, I think, from David. Uh, let's go to David. I can pass it on here if you want. Uh, where's your email? 
Where did you send it? Oh, here it is. I already have it. Save as. Save. Okay, there it is. Then I can select it here. And it reads the file, and these are the the uh, this the data in that file. And normally, when you import, what I've done here is create database files, or what David has done, a da database list. These are actually data stored in the database. But you can also select a transient list. And transient only lives in that session of the user that's logged in at that, or that uses the application at that point. So we have course code, what we need. We have course. We have program. We have program code. Program code. We have credits. Uh, that's, I think, a numerical field. And we have trimester. And what we have here is uh, now last step is to map them to the right field. So course goes there, program goes there, and program code goes there, credits and trimester. Save. So now I've created an import. Normally, uh, what I would do now is first check if that import does what I expect it to do. So here we need to add the destination. So I'm just going to use a empty interaction node, only add the import, and say, just add all these fields. Save. And this is just for testing purposes right now. So if I go back to, this is staging, to preview, if I go to courses, I should see an import, didn't save yet probably. Import courses. Browse and course sample data, import. And you can see it's working. So this is the import file. But this is just in the session. So if I close now preview and open it again, uh, it's gone. Of course, you want to transform it into data that's in different lists of the, um, of the database. So then it's going to be a little bit more, bit more complicated. Um, but we're going to work with it. So we have. An import, first we're going to loop over the import. For every one I find, I'm going to add a row to the database, to the courses uh, table, and then code and name and credits need to be filled. And it's very easy, code is filled by course code, just drag it in there. Name is filled by name, uh, that's just course. And we have uh, credits is filled by credits. And now already this is uh, this is enough to import the courses, but we also have the um, trimesters uh, and we have the programs. And this is already empty right now. Uh, but I don't want to create an uh, a row of programs for every row in the database or for every row in the import. Because if I would import this, uh, then you would see, let's drag it there for now, that the programs uh, are repeating. So I'd like to only import them uh, when there's a new one. So the fastest way to do that is to edit the loop order and say, uh, I'm going to loop over program and then over trimester like this and then i only have to do i have to check if that's the first one so let's first add the um the let's see add a decision and now i want to know if the the row i'm on has the same program code as the last one for that i need a new field that says um uh, that's the reference to, what is it, um, uh, core, no, the import. Import. And then all I have to do is check if the import of uh, course, so the previous row is the same as the current one. 
And this is a decision node. So you can see this decision, I put an expression in there and based on what the end result of the expression is, I can choose where to go. Uh, but first I need to set this, uh, this value to the current row that's at the end. So set the current row. And the first one is empty. So first one, if it's uh, the same, uh, is empty import or they're the same. If that's the case, uh, oh no, if it's empty, I need to, I need to say has value. So if the, this one has a value, then, and th they're the same, then I don't have to add a new row. If not, then I have to add a new row. So if it's yes, I continue, but if it's no, I add a row of programs and the code of programs, or this one, and the name of programs is filled by the import. So let's say we have the code, program codes, we have the name called uh, program. So that's the first step. So if it's if they're not the same, then I have to add them. And but I also have the uh, trimester. So in the trimester, I'm just going to keep it simple for myself because uh, the other option that I have, it's a little bit slower. So when you do a lot of data, this is not the right way to do it. But you can also say go to first row where the um, trimester name is the import trimester name. And if it's found, of, then what I do is set the uh, trimester reference. And if it's not found, I'll add a row to add the trimester to the database. So add row and the name of the trimester assignment is the name of the import. So there it is. The only thing we also had with trimester, we have start date and end date. And for now, I'm just going to use fixed dates. But for that, I'll have to know which trimester it is. So we have a couple that we, the trimester, can I add to the decision node? And now I can say new text exit. And what we have, we have summer, spring, winter, and fall. So summer, spring, uh, winter, and fall. <clears throat> and now it allows me to do the decision node. But to be honest, I'd rather do it in a decision or, or in the in the in itself. And I can also create an expression for this. So choose when, um, let's say this one is uh, spring, then date is uh, 221. Uh, what's the first day of spring? Let's say uh, we do uh, three and then one. Okay. Or four. 21st of so, March. Yeah. Um, no, for first of April, this. Um, and then I can do the same for the other ones. So, so this is then summer. That's first of seven. Fall. That's first of, um, what is it? Uh, 10. And then winter is 2023 and then one. Now I've created an expression that uh, automatically fills the start date of the semester. Default uh, um, date. Uh, was it again literal? I don't know. I'll just add uh, 2020. This is if it doesn't work. 
anything above this. So it just checks if this is true, then do this. If this is true, do this and just checks it all off. Oh, what did I do? Like this. So you can validate. Now, only thing I'm missing here is the program ref, which I have to set. And I can imagine for you guys, it might already look a little bit complicated, but that's just how it is. Um, and now what I do, so first I add the courses, then I check if I need to add a program. If I need to add, I add it here and then set the foreign key to the course. Then I go to trimester. I check if it's already there. If it's already there, I say, uh, this is the reference. If it's not there, I add one, set the name, set the start date, and then the end date is again an expression, which is move date um, of the start date, and then move it by three months, uh, month, like this. So this one is thus just this one by three months. Now let's uh, see if this uh, works. I'm cur curious myself, so we'll see. And and now we've made a loop to import everything, uh, and this uh, should work. So let's see. Um, we have um, this. I'm not saving yet because I just want to see if it works. And now go to courses. Import courses, import. And now you can see biolog biological sciences, you can spring. And I don't know if I do this yet, yeah, then it's not saved. So now it seems to be working. So let's save it now. Uh, yeah, and not loop like this. And now again, import it. Import. If I go here now, well, doesn't seem to work. So I've made a mistake. This one does work. Let's see. Okay. Well, this one, I'm going to do it now the easier way, which is not performing better, but let's just do this one. No, not trimester. Uh, Let's go to programs again, go to row import program is the same as the program in the list. Like this, if it's not found, I'm going to add it. If it is found, I'm going to do a default. And the only problem I now have is that I saved the data. So I'm going to delete it first before I do the import. So let's delete. Delete multiple rows of the programs. Delete multiple rows of the courses. And delete multiple rows of the trimester. So in, before I do the loop, I'm going to delete everything. And now let's see if it works. We have courses, import it. Let's go to programs. Now it does work. And one thing I could do here, just to show you some other functionality, what we also have is what we call calculated fields. And with calculated fields, I can, for instance, go to programs and say uh, count uh, courses. And that those courses are a number that count and then say is calculated. And then say count uh, programs. Uh, no count courses, I have to say, count courses, where uh, the program reference is the same, no, it's this, program reference is the same as the row ID of that program. Save. 
Um, where are we? Program overview. I'd like to add that field that I just added. I'm going to refresh for a minute. And then program. And here I'd like to add that field that I just created, the count courses. So if I save this now and preview, go to programs, and you can see 24 courses, 26, 24, 24. So quite a bit of courses per, uh, per row. Oh, it's uh, double, so it didn't delete everything I want. Why is that? Mm, course overview, no import. Is it in the import, uh, David? Probably not, right? No. Let's see, why is that not working? Now it's there only once. I don't know what I did, but um, it works now. And you can see here 12 courses, 13, 12, 12, and seven. Um, this is still very simple. Huh? So only uh, just, well, let's say the basics of connecting data together. I think the, David, what's the next step? Do you want to uh, select courses now as a student? I think that's the goal, right? You can see here also the dates that are correct. Yeah, and I think um, what we no, can do, sorry, that one, I, I was in mute. Yeah. Um, if you can publish, then I will upload this, uh, this new data already. Oh yeah, um, of course. And we had in mind to add professors to our courses through the, oh, yeah. uh, that's a good the API. Yeah. Um, yeah. What WEM allows us to do is to create APIs. And uh, I can consume an API, meaning connect to a different system and get data, expose an API, meaning uh, creating an API which other systems can use, or use remote data sources. And we have a system called Northwind, which is from Microsoft which is just an, uh, an OData service that we can use, and I can just import it quite easily. And now it's just like I've added the, uh, um, you can use them like I've added them to the database. And I think you want to use employees, right? Uh, um, yeah. David? Yeah. Okay. And um, what we have for the course, we'd like to add a professor. Uh, I think it's like this. And I can also reference to the OData list. And in this case, employees. And let's first see what's in the uh, employee overview or professor overview, professor overview. And add it to like this, professor overview. And again, just to keep the same style, I'm going to add a panel and call it Professor Overview. And here I'd like to see the OData connection that I just did. Uh, employees. Uh, let's say, uh, where are the names? Uh, first name, last name, title. Um, yeah, doesn't really matter. Let's see. Again, preview it. I haven't created a navigation item yet. And you can see here, based on the, uh, uh, these are the professors that we have. Um, and I'm just gonna, uh, yeah, add them to the, the courses, I think at random. And uh, to do that, uh, I'm gonna start again from the course overview. First add a field called professor. I've added that already, course overview. So add it to our um, data grid. So professor, uh, let's say we use last name. Um, and I'd like to use the first name as well with a comma and a space. First name. 
So now we have as a field, it just isn't filled yet. So let's uh, assign a professor. Uh, how many do we have? Uh, I think. Let's add the navigation item. Professor, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Um, yeah. Which we can we add them manually if we want. First. Uh, it's also an option, yeah. But uh, yeah, we've done the loop already, so uh, let's uh, let's do it Go already. It. So <laughs> then all I do is have the professor know the course overview and add it to the details as well. So we have professor, and then select uh, where are we. Um, course overview. I'm just going to use the same thing I'm using here. You can just copy it and then here in the option label, use this one, select professor, and then uh, sort by uh, last name only. Like this, save. Uh, and if we go to courses now, we'll see an empty professor and we can uh, edit it and say, uh, this is, hey, it's not there. Why is it not there? Oh, of course. You don't need to. This sh yeah. should. <clears throat> and now if I would select a professor, you can now select a professor. So Margaret Peacock. So this works as well. Let's publish it. Then you can uh, add some professors while you're at it, David. Yep. Um, because now again, after publishing, it's the same as, uh, as what I've uh, created in preview. Doesn't mean you're forced to have the same staging as preview. For instance, I can also say that trimester is not something I want in uh, staging. Uh, and what we have, we have a visible when um, uh, expression. And here, just as just an example, I can say is pre preview. And if I would publish it now, just to show you how it works, and this visible when can contain anything you want. So it can be based on a role or based on a value. Or for instance, if I select a certain prof program, then there's no professor and it doesn't really matter. Um, but what I can do now, if I now change the, um, now you'll see transfer. And if I, pu have I published it already? I think I did, yeah. Then if I now go to the staging environment, go to courses, and go to this. Now you can see I can select the trimester. And that's only because I changed the visible when. And this visible when is a powerful tool. It, it, it's everywhere, it's on buttons, it's on navigation items. You can use it everywhere and that's what you use to create your role-based access system uh, or just the logic in a, in a input screen where you want certain fields only to show when a certain value is met. So it's a very powerful tool. Uh, and let's remove it for now. Like this. Okay, save. Um, let's now start with, uh, let's say, uh, password control. So login functionality. Um, we have a welcome screen here, but I'm going to add some uh, login functionality to it. So first step for that is to know if, if a user is logged in. And for that, I always use an active user field. Active uh, student is what we're going to call it now. Uh, reference and call to student. And before I go to welcome, I'm going to check if this one has uh, a value. Has a value. Like this. And if it has a value, then yes. Then I can say welcome uh, student, uh, active student. 
welcome, and then first name. Safe. And um, the other option, of course, is that the, the person is not logged in. And for that, I need a login flowchart. Like this, default exit. And in this login flowchart, I'm going to show them a screen that says uh, login. And that login, um, now I'm going to use something what I haven't used up until now is that everything you see right here is uh, is just using the entire screen. Uh, I can even change it because I, what I don't want right now is this on the side. So I can change the settings of my master template, select and configure design. So say show left menu is false, that should work. Close. Uh, let's cancel. Now you don't see the left menu, um, because what WEM also has is it's it's from itself responsive, but you can change it to any way you want by, for instance, using adaptive columns. And what an adaptive columns allow, a column allows me to do is change the, the screen based on the screen size. So when it's large, I only want to see the, want the columns to be like this. And if it's um, uh, medium, I want this. And if it's small, I don't want to see the entire column at all, this one. And that's, I can remove it like this. And this allows me to create a screen that's responsive the way I want it to be responsive, instead of them doing it uh, automatically. And now I can just use, uh, for instance, uh, a login. Um, and then for login, we want a username and password. So username and new field, password. And those are, uh, of course, I want them over here. And in addition to that, in the footer, I'm going to add a button that says login. Follow button exit. Login. Sign in. And this one is going to be over the entire width, like this. And now I've created a. Um, flowchart that let's see if I drag the arrow no I did not which now if I go to home he knows I'm not logged in and you can see this is only a, a part of the screen but if I change it you can see it changing based on how I uh, how, how wide the screen is so this allows you to create a screen that works on a mobile as well as on uh, on a bigger screen or on an iPad whatever you want uh, I think it's a little bit small, so let's change it a little bit. In the large screen, I also I want to do a little bit bigger. So save, and now you can see it's a little bit bigger. Um, then, next step is we have a username password. Uh, normally, I would hash the password, but now I'm just going to store the password itself. Uh, let's do this, yeah. And... All I'm going to do now is, uh, is show you how it works, um, because what we do, first step is if someone tries to log in, we go to the row, go to row of that student with that same email where it's the username. And log in. And if it's uh, found, or if it's not found, then login failed. So we use a uh, Boolean for that. And here it just says login failed. Yes. So if it's not found, and then I go back to login. The only thing is, of course, we want the user to see it. And for that, we have things called a conditional. And a conditional only is only visible when a certain condition is met. So if login failed, is, uh, is met, if that's true, then this is shown. And I can use an alert saying uh, uh, username, uh, an icon is a uh, warning, um, username or password incorrect, save. And 
if it is found, then the next step is to check if the password is the same. So now I'll use a decision of password, and that's the same as the password I have in the database. And again, now I'm just doing it directly. Normally, you would hash this with uh, with a pepper and a salt, if that is any uh, recollection for anybody. But now uh, I'm not, this is just a demo. Um, if it's found, if, if it's uh, not the same, so default exit, then it, we fill again. And if it is the same, then the, the one is the person is logged in. So let's say yes, and the person is logged in. And then we go back to home. And then the person should be logged in. Now, of course, I know there's no user right now. So all I can see now is username, passwords incorrect. So let's go to students. Okay. Uh, we haven't, did you have any imports for students or we're gonna do it manually? I think we're gonna do manual. Huh? Um, let's yeah, go manual. to, uh, uh, let's say student overview. And then in the details, add a way to do the password. One thing I can also do is check for password strength, but that's normally when you create the password. For now, we're gonna just do the easy way and say uh, DAO, and then welcome, save. Now, um, if I would log in now, uh, I wanna see if that worked. So this template has a setting called um, user, I think, or username. And that username is uh, the same as the active students. Uh, first name plus a space plus the active student. Last name. Close. Okay. And now here you should see when I'm successfully logged in. So welcome. And now this is really uh, not best practice. So let's change that first. So here I can also say display as password. Save. And now you can't read it. Username and password incorrect. So what did I do wrong? That went Vimpentio. Uh, welcome. Ah, there it is. No thanks. Welcome, Dawa. And now I'm logged in. So this now allows me to create the user-based uh, uh, access. Uh, because what I can do now is go to... Um, uh, instead of in the navigation, what I've done up until now is put true everywhere. But now I can also say, create a calculated field that says is logged in. Yes, no. And then a person is logged in if it has a value for active student. Save. And now I can just, instead of this true, I can say is logged in. And the same for courses. Uh, is logged in. And the same for uh, trimester. Is logged in. And the same for professor. I'm not going to do students right now because then you can't create a new one. And this is just for demo. But now you can see these are now visible. But if I would preview again, you can see they're not visible until I log in. No thanks. Um, now. I think next step is to, uh, I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, yeah, I think the time? we need to check. Alvaro, um, how much time do we have left? Um, I think we have between 10, 15 minutes. Okay. I think maybe before we, uh, before we continue here, what we can do is see if there's uh, any questions or remarks so far. Because uh, obviously we can keep building and building and the next step would be to sort of create a, a shopping basket for each student where he can add his programs and, you know, choose his trimesters and, and, and all this sort of stuff. 
um, which we can do with the next 15 minutes, but perhaps there are, there are questions from anybody or, or remarks or doubts. Anybody? Well, I don't know if you already said that or something, but I have like a general a question in general. Um, okay. This demo of WEM, is it like a platform that you can use online or is it like a private service that we can, like, we can download okay. or purchase or something? You want this to take is, that uh, down? Working in the browser. Yeah, this is working in the browser. So you can see here, uh, everything here is working in the browser. And if you want to make an account for yourself, so if you want to go, uh, you can go to uh, my.vem.io and then create account. And when you have an account, well, then you need to do the two factor. Yeah. So for one, one, two, eight. Already have an account. Then from here, you can go to the modeler, which I've just shown you. And you can also do training, go to support, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's all online. So to answer your question, Wendoli, you, you can go to either my.wem.io or even if you go to wem.io, there's a button top right get that says start for free. You guys can all make your uh, your own accounts and start uh, playing around. And then when you go to this area, which is your, your account, uh, section, shall we say, in the training section, there is a there is a free training. So it takes you step by step through the creation of an application. Uh, you actually create a, a little web shop with some inventory management and so on. Um, so yeah, feel feel free to go ahead and create your own accounts and uh, yeah, start playing around. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? I just have one one small question. Is there uh, some kind of limitation um, regarding the web server that you can run the application? Okay, there is a couple of options. So when the way we are uh, doing it during this demo is we're obviously just running it off the of the servers of web and there is a multi-cloud strategy so that means that um we are using the web public cloud but you can also install the web runtime in your applications to a private cloud uh which can be you know an amazon aws google cloud whichever one you choose or you can even install the runtime in your applications on on premise that gets done um by deploying through kubernetes so there's a cluster that gets deployed to wherever it is you want to have it uh, and then when you go ahead in the future and click on publishing uh, that will redirect or you will have the option to redirect uh, instead of publishing to the, the standard web service, you can redirect that and publish it to your own server, whether it's private cloud or, or, or public. Okay, thank I, you. Alexander, Alexander has a question in the chat. I see that. Uh, okay, so what you create with WEM are either web-based applications or uh, you can create native mobile applications as well. So you can create um, iOS or Android applications. In the case of um, iOS and Android, what the system does, it will build an executable for you. So you can upload that to the relevant app store and people can download it from there. Um, on the web-based, you cannot export it. So you can only publish it through the modeler to whichever server you've set up. 99% of the time people use the web server because it's nice and easy. But if you go public cloud, uh, uh, sorry, private cloud or, or on-prem, you can publish over there. Web does not generate code. So it does not uh, generate a bunch of code that you can then install on a computer, which is what allows it to be so quick in creating new iterations of your program. And what makes this um, publishing uh, 
process completely seamless as well. So people that are using your application, if you guys are now in staging, you know, every time that, that DAO clicks publish the staging, you can actually keep, keep using it. And it doesn't, uh, doesn't have any downtime really, unless you're making big, big changes. All right, I see Ignacio, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for, for all this webinar. Um, and uh, you, you just said that this does not generate code, but what if I do have some sort of complicated stuff or algorithm that I need to, to use somehow and incorporate into an application right. developed by WEM? There are many different ways. So what you do is if you have that algorithm, in most cases, you're able to, to, to replicate your algorithm within web. Uh, that's what most people do if you just have uh, uh, a certain workflow that you want to incorporate, you will just rebuild it. It's almost quickest and easiest. Uh, other options are if you have an existing application that you want to, let's say, outsource some functionality to, you can integrate with an API. WEM can connect to anything that is uh, REST, SOAP, or data, raw HTTP requests. So you can connect to any of those. And then there is still an option, which we haven't really looked at, of uh, using widgets. And widgets are specific parts of functionality that you can drag and drop into any, um, into any, any flow chart. Maybe, Dawa, if you can head over to, let's say, the uh, program overview and drop in a, a chart of how many courses per program we have or something like that while I finish explaining. That would be awesome. Yeah, let, um, me, let me finish this. Um, sure. yeah. So this. what you can do there, the widgets within WEM, you can also create your own widgets. Now that is coding, right? And the widgets are a combination of JavaScript, CSS, and a little bit of WEM script. WEM script more, more than anything is to, to sort of check which variables you have running in your JavaScript and okay. say where they need to connect to. So that's also an option uh, of integrating extra code from elsewhere. And then there are some other options. You know, there, there are ways of uh, within the navigation item templates that we saw, um, mm -hmm. you can use inline scripting. So there's a, a, a little hook at the top that you drag okay. and drop in there and you just plug in whatever it is you want. All depending on what do I need to do? What do I want to do? How complex is it? If I leave it on the other side, is it better to integrate depending on, on, on performance as well? Okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Ignacio. Anybody else? I mean, I see now that, that Dao is... Uh, is dragging in some uh, widgets where we can now see, you know, how many. How long have you been developing? When for how long? That has been going for quite a while, but it is, it is fairly easy. Uh, the the first. Uh, do you mean when we started with the platform, or when we I started building with them? No, the platform itself. We started sixteen years ago. Okay. Uh, with the first version but this version that you see now is version 4 and we started from the ground up in 2017 I think okay. Okay. so it's been so this one is now running the latest uh, um, .NET Core which is the latest uh, of .NET um, thank you to give you an idea of where is WEM used, because I think that's interesting as well. There's a lot of low-code, no-code uh, platforms out there these days. A lot of them um, are fairly new, but as Dawood just mentioned, you know, WEM has been around for quite a while. It started as an internal tool for the company that developed it, then became a tool uh, that they commercialized. Uh, and so it's been rebuilt from the ground up already four times, which uh, which means that it's it's you know, it's pretty well tested, shall we say. Okay. Um, clients who use it, uh, the Dutch government, big client, uh, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Education, six or seven more. 
Um, automotive, we have labels like uh, BMW, Daimler-Benz, um, recently Volvo China has joined as well, who are working together with a brand partner called DXC Technology, which you may have never heard of, very big company, mm -hmm. used to be HP Services. Um, they're building part of their back end for uh, receiving and manipulating data from the driverless cars that they are testing. A okay. big part of that is built in web. So you can get it very complex. And that's why I'm saying, like, depending on what your algorithm is that you want to build, there's probably a good chance you can build it within WEM if they're doing okay. medium data points uh, on driverless cars, okay. right? Um, since recently, WEM has been in LATAM for a little over a year, uh, which is where I come in and, and, and my team. I'm based in Panama, just not too far away from you guys, <laughs> uh, which is also where uh, Xander Systems comes in, which is one of our partners who helped set up this, uh, this webinar. And we have yes. a representative here, Marco. Uh, and we will leave our, our, document, uh, our contact information in the chat at the end. Uh, but yeah, we started on our first government projects here in Panama a few months ago, and very soon, by the end of next month, there will be a first public portal available for, I always forget the word in, in English, but tramites, uh, okay. uh, with the government over here. <laughs> yes. Very soon, also starting with uh, Grupo Telefonica. They're okay. doing five separate pilots with us. And we have a lot of things that are going to be coming up soon in, in Costa Rica as well. Uh, so yeah, we're we're growing quite fast, and and there's a lot of enthusiasm, which I'm glad to see that there's some of this shared here as well. Thank you. Thank Anybody you else with a question? Because I think by now, Dow has built the whole system, and and we can sell it. He's <laughs> on a creative spin. <laughs> Did anybody have any any questions still? No? Okay. What I'm going to do, Marco, I assume you are okay with me sharing your uh, your email in the chat here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I will yeah. put the email, as you can see, Marco arroba sandor cr punto com. Uh, that is our local partner, one of our strategic partners in Costa Rica. Uh, please feel free to contact Marco. I will put mine in here as well. And at wem.io. So feel free to contact me as well. We are the regional representatives uh, for Latin America, or me and my team, let's put it that way. Uh, feel free to start using when you know there's uh we've shown you where you can start making uh, your own account and yeah if you have any questions you have marco and me at your disposal to to ask any questions there is a very good um forum as well in your my.wem.io environment there's a forum where there's a very lively um development community not yet too many people who speak Spanish in there, but if you speak English in anything, you get stuck. Head over there, have a look around. Most of the answers will be on there. And if not, just shoot off a question. Uh, and probably by the time you wake up the next day, you will have five different ways of doing it, uh, all of which are going to work just fine. Yes, and in WEM, at the WEM portal, por por there, there are also a lot of resources for self-learning Yes, WEM. Uh, and keeping track of all the steps that you've uh, uh, already learned until you get the end. And uh, there are so many also exercises that you can go through and, and check them and, and modify them according to your uh, preferences. And uh, the uh, training uh, allows you to create an e-commerce a real e-commerce site. So it is not uh, something easy to create uh, 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 by hand coding. Uh, you need to do so many things, but in the end with uh, WEM is something easy and it is, uh, and it is very 
uh, simple and guided through all the examples that are given in all the training. And there is a, an excellent manual and an excellent uh, documentation also and videos and everything that can be used there. So uh, we invite you uh, to, to access the free accounts of WEN and so you, so you can evaluate the, the, the tool, the platform. Also, I want to say uh, 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 that uh, next week, uh, uh, Central Tech and us, are, we are going to give the last of the three series of these kind of webinars. Uh, the last one it is going to be uh, a forum uh, with five panel panelists. Uh, uh, in this case, Doe, uh, uh, Doe, uh, and David, myself, and and also two customers that are already using in Dutch uh, the um, web platform, and and we will have want to have also Ignacio Trejos as the moderator, and uh, we are going to be more than uh, pleased and that uh, everybody uh, get along with us and, and make the, your questions because it is going to be something open, uh, agnostic in technology, but also based in web. So um, you are invited <laughs> in a week uh, at night at a.m. Perfect. Do we have the, the link at hand? For the next uh, session. Yeah, I was just gonna ask that. Uh, are you gonna send us the, the invite via email or something? I think the university is is. Uh... Yes, I have. I have the. I have the link. If you want, I can share it in the in the chat or at once. Or yeah, that that, that would be to, perfect. To okay. okay, give me a couple of minutes and I will share it. There, there is a question by David Gerardo. Is it possible to connect sensors and have an IoT app? Yes, it is. Um, the at the moment uh, we kind of go back to to what I mentioned before about integrations, right? So at the moment you would have to connect through a web service, either REST, uh, SOAP, or Data. Um, I keep forgetting what the standard languages in IoT systems, ta -ta 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 -ta. there's going to be uh, a more direct integration. But at the moment, you know, most most IoT sensors they will have from their vendors have a way of connecting your sensors online. And from there, we can pull and push. Uh, we had the same question from uh, from a client in a demo, uh, I think with, with Marco. Yes, true. Marco, you were there. Uh, they asked us, hey, we have some switches, uh, they are connected uh, through this, this is the, the brand we want to use. And the vendor had uh, like an online testing area and within five minutes we had integrated with these switches and we were putting, clicking on and off some switches that were in somewhere in the US. Um, yeah. So yeah, there are other parts of um, IoT integrations that have been done. Uh, <laughs> For example, Arrow Electronics. I don't know if you've heard of them. Uh, very big electronics provider. Uh, they make sensors for Formula One cars. I'm not going to say that they're using Wemfront Formula One cars. Not yet. Um, but they have tried with all kinds of sensors, multi, let's say multi-factor sensors, with up to eight different measurements being taken. Um, that can then be monitored with uh, what's happening with WEM. And here over in Panama, we're actually looking at, at doing some stuff with the sensors they have in many different points in the Panama Canal. Ignacio, I see you have another question. Yes, just a quick one. Um, perhaps I missed it. Um, if may I export data into, let's say, relational databases or non-relational databases for doing analytics outside of one. Okay, the way to export would be, um, we saw an import node at some David, point. David, can, go ahead. Do you mind if I leave? Uh, no, 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 I know you have to go. Uh, yeah? You've done so more I've than built a, already, thanks very much. I've built a quite <laughs> ugly uh, way to add courses. Uh, of course, it needs some uh, needs to be a little bit better, but at least it works and I publish. So anybody who wants to check it uh, can see for themselves. Okay, perfect. 
Thank you. Thanks very much, Dawa. Uh, thank you very much, Dawa. Yes. Thank you uh, for your time. Dawa, thank, thank you. you. Thanks again. Um, so, yes, the, we saw an import note earlier uh, where you could bring in JSON, XML, uh, CSV, and Excel. Mm -hmm. There is a similar export note that, that offers a way of, of exporting things. Uh, the other way is to expose your data. So if you have a, let's see if I've got the, the thing here open, I can show it very quickly. But basically you can create APIs very quickly. And let me see. And ta -ta -ta -ta. here we are. So if we have our, our, our current system here, which I think, yeah, you should be able to see. Um, so if we wanted to expose our data, you see that in the web services section, there is uh, a tab here that says expose. So we can create a new web service, call it test, test again. And here for the three environment that WEM has, which is a preview, which is the development environment, that we use today, staging, which is for functional testing, which we published it today as well. And then you have live, which is where your, your final application is working. As you can see, for each of these environments, you can set separate encryption and authentication methods, you know, using certificates, passwords, et cetera, et cetera. So if we just create one, then within our, uh, our web service, we can start creating operations like, I don't know, something like called courses. And then within courses, we can start defining what our, our input uh, and output is. So what we are expecting for whoever's calling the data to put in. And then what we're going to push back is, I don't know, like the program. Um, and so you build up your whole, your whole web service like this. Again, nice and easy, same as building in your data model. And then you have a flow chart of where you're going to define, if I get this, what am I going to send in return? And you basically map it out over here. And what WEM does uh, while we're doing this is for each environment, it creates a public URL with the API documentation. So there is an option here to download a WSDL file uh, and a, a full one, basic one. But also for each operation, we have the request and response examples. And we have them available in SOAP 1.1, 1.2, JavaScript, and the JSON as well for uh, the RESTful API. And it'll show you, okay, this is what I'm supposed to send and this is what I'm going to get back. I think we've taken up a lot of time already. If there's any <laughs> further questions, I think yes, we can save I have one, uh, well, two things. The first one, I've already published in the chat the link for the next webinar so that everybody can have it. And the next question is, how do you integrate when with a version control? Okay. There's a, several different ways of doing it. At the moment, there is no automatic connection that you can make with, let's say, like GitHub or something. That is actually on the roadmap for later on this year, um, where there's going to be direct integration. At the moment, there are many different ways of, of, of um, yeah, taking care of your version control. Some of it has to do with uh, different versions, as you saw, between preview, staging, and live, so you can, so you can move ahead there. Um, there are other ways of, of uh, creating different versions of your project and then having them hooked up um, to the publishing process, yes or no. Um, there are ways of building your own little version control, which they've done in the Dutch government, for example. You know, they wanted to have it fully custom made, so they've integrated with the modeler to see where all the applications that they're building are uh, in the process. So, yeah. That's the, 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 the long answer. There's no integration with existing version control at the moment. There is built-in version controls uh, for separate ways of doing it for mobile and for web-based. Uh, mobile, you will have like a build history as well of, of all the builds that you've done. Um, and you can get extremely granular on 
rolling out new new functions. So WEM is very suitable for agile creation of software. So continuous iteration, just adding new features, this, that, and the other on the fly. Um, and what a lot of people do, rather than creating completely separate versions, is they will have um, forks in their workflows that when they say, okay, I'm using uh, version 1.1 of my current software, then it directs one way. And if it's version 1.2, it'll direct somewhere else. And they have a very quick way of then in staging, uh, you know, you just stick a drop down at the top where you see, I want to see how this works in version 1.1. And now I want to see how it works in version 1.2. And the, you get redirected through these flows. Um, and it means that you can work on, yeah, very tiny bits of uh, functionality that you're adding in a very, um, uh, very flexible way. So that's some of the, the things that can be done on, on, on version control. Does that answer your question, Alvaro? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I think we can keep going, uh, but we should keep some questions for next week as well. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. And over here, we are coming up to, to lunchtime as well, so I have, to, uh, I have to duck out. But thank you very, very much for the, the, the time. Uh, thanks very much for all the, the questions, for the attention from everybody, for uh, showing up uh, in, in, in good numbers. Uh, you have our contact details there. Please you know, feel free to, to shoot off an email, and we do hope that you, you know, start playing around. It's, uh, I don't have an IT background. I, I can't do a demo quite as fast as, uh, as Dawa does, but um, I'm getting close. Uh, WEM is very friendly to just dive in and start playing around. We didn't get to some of the debug features, for example, but basically when something goes wrong, most of the time WEM will stop you from doing it. Uh, and when you do it, it's very quick to point out very easily, like, you know, this is what's going wrong over here. Um, so if you do, start using the, the online training, just dive in and experiment and enjoy. Okay, All right. Thank, thank you so much for the information. Very welcome. So thank you, David. Thank you, Marco, and everybody to show up, uh, Don Ignacio also. And uh, <laughs> we'll see you next week. Thank you very much, Marco, David, and Okay, oh. thank you everybody also. Goodbye. And I can see you the next week. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, David. <laughs>